to complete the points I mentioned to you regarding fir socket and plantation in the posterior regions, we should start here. Well, an atraumatic extraction, or better yet, a less traumatic extraction, in the posterior areas almost forces me, as the surgeon, to perform the extraction not as a closed procedure, but rather as an open, surgical procedure, often involving sectioning of the roots. Therefore, first socket implantation in the molar area means that the remaining molar tooth must be extracted by sectioning the roots. The roots need to be removed one by one to ensure that the maximum amount of periodontium around the tooth is preserved. Even in the premolar area, this sectioning can be performed. That is, for the upper fourth tooth, we can section it and remove the buccal and palatal roots separately. This is about less traumatic extraction and maximum preservation of bone and soft tissue around the tooth where we want to perform first socket implantation in the posterior areas. Regarding the correct drilling point, in almost all posterior teeth, the furcation, that is, right in the middle of the tooth, is the correct area to start drilling. For the upper fourth tooth, the correct point is slightly toward the palatal from the furcation point. For the upper six and seven teeth, it's exactly at the furcation, and for the lower six and seven teeth as well, it's exactly at the furcation, that is, right in the center of the tooth crown is the correct point for drilling and, ultimately, for implant placement, now, what should I do to prevent my drill from slipping off the furcation and veering toward one of these three sockets in the upper teeth, or in the case of lower molars, the two sockets mesially and distally? What can I do to make sure my drill doesn't enter one of these sockets and instead drills exactly at the furcation? Here, I can precisely use a straight hand piece and a round drill to carefully turn the distinctly sharp anatomical tip of the furcation bone into a smooth, flat surface. This way, your drill won't slip. Let's go ahead and do it. You saw that I turned the prominent sharp furcations into a flat surface so that my starter drill wouldn't slip. It's even a little bit concave. I did this using a round drill and a straight hand piece. Now I'm going to use the starter drill and just like I mentioned at the beginning of the session, pay attention to the natural mesial angulation of the teeth. We're keeping the curve of the aspid in mind. We're also considering the Monson sphere. If I see that the direction of the crown and root of the anterior tooth looks good on the OPG, that's a guy for me. If I see that the direction of the crown and root of the posterior tooth looks good mesiodistally on the OPG, that's also a guy for me. All of these help you to perform your drilling in the correct mesiodistal direction. Let's move on to the next drill. After the first one or two drills, place parallel pin again, and once more, you can evaluate buccolingual and mesiodistal. Now pay attention my drilling is exactly in the fork area. I didn't let it enter any of the sockets. Not the palatal socket, mesiobuccal, or distobuccal, rather, Drilling is exactly in the fork area so our implant can be placed there. Not all posterior teeth are candidates for first socket implantation. Not all molar teeth are candidates for first socket implantation. Being able to determine from the preoperative radiograph, to a good extent, whether this posterior molar is suitable for first socket implantation is very important. This is extremely important whether the roots of the molar teeth are divergent or convergent, that is, 
whether they are coming together or spreading apart, is important. If they are divergent, the bone in the furcation area is substantial, and it's a good case for first socket. But if they are convergent, it means there isn't suitable bone in the furcation area. It's not a good case for first socket. Per the upper molar, the distance between the apex of the extracted tooth and the floor of the sinus, that is, the amount of remaining bone, determines whether you can achieve stability and perform first socket implantation or not. If this bone is good, it's a good case for first socket. If distance is small, roots are inside sinus. Not ideal for first socket implantation. At minimum, a sinus lift may be needed and stability difficult. Similar for lower molars. The distance from the apex to the nerve canal determines whether it's a good case for first socket or not. If there's bone between the tooth apex and the nerve, three or four millimeters, it's a case for socket. You can get anchorage from that bone. You can get primary stability, but if the distance between the tooth apex and the nerve is very small, it's not a good case for first socket. This determines whether you can promise your patient a first socket implant after extracting a posterior tooth or not. Another very good indicator that helps you determine, from a buccolingual perspective, whether you've done your drilling in the correct position, whether you're within the buccolingual width or not. This is determined by where your parallel pin contacts when the patient closes their mouth, specifically which area of the opposing arch teeth it touches, where should it actually make contact. Your implant is supposed to withstand functional forces, so it should contact the functional area of the opposing arch. For the fresh socket of a lower molar, if your implant is positioned correctly buccolingually, when the patient closes their mouth after the first couple of drills, your parallel pin should hit the functional part of the upper tooth. That is, it should contact the palatal or at most the central fossa of the upper jaw. If you're doing a fresh socket in the upper jaw and the patient closes their mouth into occlusion, your parallel pin should hit the functional part of the lower jaw. It should contact the buckle, or at most the central fossa of the tooth. So this is also a really good indicator to determine whether you've done your drilling at the correct buccolingual angle or not. When everything checks out, after verifying with a parallel pin, now we can move on to continue drilling. Again, just like with the anterior socket preparation, for the posterior socket preparation, it's also better to use fixtures that are more tapered. I'm using a dentist fixture, and since it's tapered, it gives me a more predictable primary stability. When restoring a posterior tooth, using a platform and a fixture with a larger diameter, like 4.5, for 0.7 or 5.2, allows for less vase-shaped form and triangular space under the crown once it's placed. The patient will complain less about food getting stuck under crown. So, in the anterior regions, narrower fixtures are used, while in the posterior regions, larger fixtures like 4.5, for 0.7, or 5.2 are more suitable. Let's move on to implant insertion. We're starting the insertion of our fixture. Here, the depth at which the fixture is placed is very important. We follow the same principles. For millimeters from the free gingival margin and two millimeters from the healthy buccal bone crest indicates proper implant depth. Also, the furcal bone, two millimeters below the healthy buccal crest, serves as a good indicator for implant placement depth. I mentioned three indicators. The implant platform should be at the level of the furcal bone, two millimeters below the healthy buccal bone crest, or four millimeters from the free gingival margin. That was fresh socket implant placement in the anterior aesthetic zone of the maxilla, and we reviewed its key points together.